Hello and good morning and you're very welcome to the Leaders Lounge live series here in Grant Thornton in the heart of Dublin City. We're very fortunate today to have the Governor of the Central Bank, Gabriel McClough, as our special guest and we're also joined by the Managing Partner of Grant Thornton, Michael McAteer. Gentlemen, you're both very welcome. Now, the format for today is very simple and it's very straightforward. The Governor is going to make some introductory remarks. Afterwards, we're going to have a questions and answer session with the Governor and also with Michael. Uh, to make my job a lot easier, I'm encouraging you all to ask as many questions as you possibly can across a wide variety of subjects. Uh, if you look on the right-hand side of your screens, you'll see the capacity to ask questions, get them in, and we'll endeavour to get as many questions to the Governor and to Michael as we possibly can over the course of the next hour. Now, I don't want to be taking up your time by talking needlessly, so with that, Governor, I'll hand it over to yourself to make some introductory remarks before we get around to some questions. And once again, thank you very much for joining us here this morning. Thank you, Ian, and uh, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to participate in this event, and I look forward to uh, discussing both the importance of leadership and some of the challenges uh, for leaders, the ones we've faced and the ones uh, ahead of us. I mean, last year was uh, extremely difficult for people all over the world. The public health emergency was and remains severe, although thankfully great progress has been made on a vaccine. But we still have a way to travel to return to some semblance of normality or perhaps a new normal. Uh, thinking back to 2019, all those many, many, many years ago, I couldn't have imagined the pace of technological adaptation that was just around the corner with millions of people working regularly from home, video conferencing, shopping and learning online, etc. I expect some of these changes will outlast the virus. This crisis is very different to that of the financial and sovereign debt crisis. It's first and foremost a health crisis. Uh, the economic crisis arising from the pandemic has uh, to my knowledge, and I've said this before, no precedent in modern history. Uh, I haven't found any examples of economies voluntarily um, closing down in the way so much of the world ha has chosen to. An important difference to what we experienced 10 years ago is the fact that the financial system has been able, so far at least, to absorb rather than amplify the effects of the shock. The government uh, has also had significant resources available to respond to the pandemic, with the rise in the deficit and debt ratios uh, both warranted and necessary. Policy, therefore, has been a, in a position to support the productive capacity of the economy and avoid scarring effects such as long-term unemployment. Nonetheless, the more prolonged the need for measures to contain the pandemic, the greater the risk that liquidity problems will evolve into solvency pressures for affected businesses and uh, ultimately greater challenges for the financial system and uh, wider economy. The enormity of the policy response is visible in the data. For example, at its peak last year, approximately 1.2 million people in Ireland were in receipt of some form of income support. But despite this response, we estimate unemployment is likely to increase from 6.2% in 2020 to an average of 9.3% this year before declining to 7.8% in 2022, a rate well above the pre-pandemic level of uh, around 5%. Uh, though high, for comparison, the unemployment rate peaked at just over 16% in 2011 2012 now, from the outset, the central bank has prioritized dealing with the pandemic's impact on the financial system and on consumers. Our near-term crisis response has been focused on the financial system being able to support households and businesses through the pandemic and into the recovery. And this has had different dimensions. I mean, for monetary policy, we've worked with our euro system colleagues to maintain favorable financing conditions across the euro area. Our macroprudential policy stance in Ireland is intended to enable the financial system to absorb losses from the shock and maintain the supply of lending to households and businesses. And we're focused on the approach of the financial system to managing distressed debt, including that related to pre-existing mortgage 
careers. Now, looking ahead, what happens to household savings will be important for the Irish economy as individuals and households may choose to use them for consumption in the future when circumstances allow. And the relative resilience of the public finances overall should contribute to economic recovery uh, in 2021, as we hope that the widespread vaccinations allow the economy to start functioning without restrictions once more. And uh, as I discussed last week uh, in a speech, rebuilding and strengthening this resilience is a key priority for the central bank. Now, perhaps one of the uh, unique experiences that many of us will have had over the last year is leading organizations remotely. Leadership through the pandemic has brought its challenges. Technology has enabled organizations such as the Central Bank where work can be done remotely to continue to operate. But as time has gone on, the drawbacks to building and maintaining the relationships and uh, the social capital that contribute to a successful organization become apparent. As governor, my number one priority has been the care of our people. Fighting an invisible virus has created enormous anxiety for everyone in the community, and it's no different to people who work for us. A radical shift in working arrangements has been accompanied with added caring and teaching responsibilities, in many cases at least, along with the changes in our normal patterns of social interaction. The mental and physical well-being of our people has been an important focus for, uh, for me and my senior team. We know that it can sometimes be difficult to admit to ourselves that we need additional help and support, but we all need to ensure we create a culture in organisations where people know it's okay to ask for help. Remote working is not an excuse not to listen to our people. Another feature of the pandemic is that it has become very difficult to plan. Uh, and certainly difficult to plan our personal lives. And at a time when the lines of work and home have become very, very blurred, it's particularly important that people take leave and use it uh, to switch to support their own well-being. We have, wherever possible, looked to address the enormous uncertainty around our daily lives by giving people as much certainty as we can. So, for example, before Christmas, we told our people, uh, that we would carry on working remotely until at least the end of May, giving them some certainty to help them plan their lives. I mean, during enormous certainty, the clarity and regularity, enormous uncertainty, the clarity and regularity of uh, communications is particularly important. So we're learning to operate in new ways and now thinking about what it means for the longer term. We're exploring what our future operating model uh, might look like, what we've learned over uh, from the forced um, experiment of the last 11 months, what we should keep and what we should let go so that we can keep uh, con and continue uh, to do our jobs effectively over the longer term. I mean, one of my key responsibilities uh, is the stewardship of the central bank into the long term. So I'm particularly interested in the impact of remote working over a long period of time on collaboration, on the sharing of knowledge and on the development of uh, an organization's uh, social and intellectual capital. Now, of course, there are many leadership challenges to face throughout the pandemic. Remote working is not possible for everyone, including some people in the central bank. And for many people across the country, reorganization or redundancy has been the reality of the destruction of the last 11 months. Managing the impact on people is the single biggest leadership challenge that we face. So I don't think I'm alone in thinking about such issues and look forward to hearing and learning how you have managed, how your organizations have adapted and how you see the future. So I'll stop there, Ian. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you very much for that. And I'll come back to you in one moment, Governor. But Michael, the Governor mentioned there the solvency crisis, the financial crash of a decade ago. You were I don't want to say instrumental is the wrong word, but you were very busy during that period um, between being the administrator of Quinn Insurance, restructuring some very significant companies. Um, when you look now and you say the similarities and the differences between that crisis and this crisis, which I think, as the governor rightly put, is a health crisis. Absolutely. I mean, I think there are just so, many, so much more difference between now and 2008 
If you look back in 2008, it, it, was, a, it was a global financial crisis, but in this country particularly, the construction sector and the property section uh, had a, an overwhelming crash and, and had an impact straight away. I think the balance sheets of companies were significantly undercapitalized back then, not just in the financial sector, but right across uh, all of our industries. And they weren't built to sustain and had got probably a bit fat and a bit inefficient in, in, in the way they were operating. I think that stretched then also into people's personal balance sheets in the sense of overstretching. Uh, and when the financial crisis happened, it impacted on every individual person in this country. And then of course led to significant unemployment as the governor has pointed out. But I think the big difference there also was consumer confidence because when people's personal balance sheets are impacted to such a large extent, the ability then for the individual to go out and spend, discretion we spend, whether that's in the service sector, whether it's in large purchases from household goods, is impacted about their confidence that they're going to have a job, they're going to have an income into the future. I think this is a completely different scenario. And I think it, not just in the theory, but actually in practice, because every time the economy reopened during 2020 for that short period of time, you could see the pent up demand in the spending uh, and, and the ability to, for, for people to get back out and start to have some kind of normal, normality within their, their life. I do think the difference though between maybe 2020 and 2008 is that there has been a change in probably pe people's behaviors. And I think some sectors won't recover post-2020, 2021, not because of the economic or not because of consumer confidence, but that the, the traditional way of people spending their money has fundamentally changed. And I don't think we're going to go back to the way we were in across all sectors. So I see a two-tier recovery. I see some sectors bouncing straight back when, when the economy and the people are allowed to basically get that, but other sectors are going to have to adapt, or unfortunately the business model has probably been fundamentally changed by the crisis. Uh, Governor, I want to come to leadership in, in a moment, but just drawing from something Michael has just said there is that idea of the twin track recovery. Is that something, you, is a sentiment you share? And if so, what sectors are you more concerned about? Yeah, no, I do, I do share that. I mean, we've seen that in the, um, uh, especially in Ireland, in the, in the data of the last 11 months where, you know, Exports and particularly uh, pharmaceuticals, medical supplies, IT have done actually reasonably well, um, and will probably mean that that Ireland had a positive GDP. I know there's all sorts of issues with that uh, number, but had a positive GDP last year. Um, but we also know that unemployment is very high, as I said earlier. So um, the pattern, and it it is reflected in to different extents across Europe, is of an uneven uh, recovery. And uh, I think, uh, I mean, I do agree. Um, I mean, one, we've seen it in the evidence. Two, uh, I suspect, and I said it uh, a few minutes ago, I suspect that some of the changes in behaviour enforced so far will continue. I mean, the big question is, um, is the extent to which, uh, to, to my mind in particular, is the extent to which retail um, uh, our retail habits are going to change. Um, and, I mean, I think they will to some extent, but I don't know to what extent. And I think that's the big question for me. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to get in. I see the questions are starting to flock in, Governor, so I'll come to those in a moment. But it is the leader's lounge. And I, I remember the economist Colin McCarthy once famously described the governor of the central bank as a smart man in the bank, in the back room, managing all the money. Um, that's kind of the public perception of the role. We never normally think about the role as the CEO of a very large organization, which you're also as well. And I'm really interested about your style of leadership, particularly when you arrived in Ireland, you're in the job, and then suddenly you're working from home and all of your staff are effectively working from home. How do you go about stamping your own new leadership style upon a very large organization? during a time of unparalleled crisis? Well, it, <laughs> um, I'm certainly uh, running my own experiment, uh, if you could put it like that. Um, I had six months, uh, roughly, um, in a traditional way of introducing myself to the organisation. Uh, and I've had 11 months uh, of working remotely. I mean, the fact that everybody is in the same boat, has been in the same boat for the last 11 months has helped. Um, I've, uh, I've led organizations, uh, sizable organizations in the past. 
Um, so, I, but I've, you know, I've never had to sort of introduce myself uh, in this way. Um, my focus, and I said it in my in my remarks a few minutes ago, you know, my main focus, uh, organizations like mine, uh, and certainly the ones I've led before, are really about people. You know, at the end of the day, we don't have lots of big machinery. Um, uh, we're not manufacturing sort of uh, airplanes uh, or whatever. We're really about people and uh, focusing on the people, looking after the people. I mean, I tend to have quite an open style. Um, I, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're 2,000 people, so there's a limit to the, uh, the sort of practicalities of connecting uh, with uh, as many of them as I would like. Um, but we've had a program throughout the last uh, year plus uh, of me and my senior team um, inviting uh, members of, uh, you know, of the central bank to join us on sort of Q&A type sessions, which have lasted about an hour ago, doing those on a weekly basis. Uh, so people have got to know me, um, uh, you know, in this uh, strange, strange world we live in. But um, I, uh, you know, I, I'm very happy to hear from other people as to how you uh, uh, you lead, and certainly how you introduce yourself uh, in a remote environment. I mean, one of the things, one of the challenges I, I am worried about um, and thinking about uh, quite a lot is how, if this remote working world continues, um, and to a certain extent, I don't think we're going to go back at the central bank, at least, to um, everyone coming back into the office. We are going to move to what people are talking about as a hybrid model of some sort, which is how do you introduce new people into the organization? We had some new graduates join us in October. Um, you know, many of them first time in the world of work. Um, how do you introduce them to the culture um, of the place? How, how, do you, how do you get them to sort of learn? Uh, when I was young, I remember I, I learned by just watching what leaders were doing. Um, so uh, this is a massive uh, enforced experiment for many people throughout the world and uh, uh, for me as well. Michael, I'll just bring you in on that. Uh, it's, it's that idea of bringing new talent in and remote working and trying to lead a large organisation turning an economic shutdown. I mean, your office is vacant. We're here today to do this, but you know, people might come in and out, but nominally it's shut down. It's huge. I mean, you know, to the governor's point, we have 1,500 staff members, employees, colleagues in our organisation, but approximately one third of them are going through various training aspects, as training accountants, uh, tax advisors, or, or other professional exams. And it's a very structured environment of a, a three or four year apprenticeship. Uh, and some of that training is technical training that are delivered through the various institutes. But a huge amount of that training for the future accountants and, and advisors in, in the world is the development training, the part they see by being with senior colleagues. When you walk into a meeting room with a client or with a prospective client, reading body language, understanding how the questions are posed, understanding the, the answers that happened, that happens through osmosis. That happens by being in a room. And I think that's one of the, the, the most difficult aspects of, of this digital world is it's very functional. You can perform a task, but that extra developmental part by just listening and being, a, being in a room, being given a small piece of, of, of work to do and then sending it back and getting feedback, that instantaneous feedback, um, it's something that we have to work extremely hard on. And I think what I've learned as a leader, I think over the last 12 months, is that um, we actually have to have 1,500 different solutions. You cannot have one solution or you can't have one solution that gets 80% of the way you've actually got to recognize that every single person is, is living this differently. There are commonalities right across the board, but there's no one person who's actually experiencing exactly the same as their colleague. And it's a collective, you know, there are things that are from the top down, so communication, communication, communication. I've never done so much communication, but if I ask my staff, what is it they want more of? It's communication. Um, but I also think it's though it's not just top down, but what we have to ensure also is our colleagues communicate with each other that um, experience that you would have had by just having a coffee with somebody, having lunch with somebody, and, and just talking about things, you've got to structure to actually have unstructured conversation. Because if you don't do that, it just will basically fall by the wayside. 
And we've constantly surveyed our staff. And, and I, I think what I find probably the most interesting was the last survey we did, which was only four weeks ago, um, at the height of probably you know, January, um, it's, it was dark, the numbers in relation to, 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 to the COVID cases were quite high, but 22% of our staff actually wish to work post-COVID exclusively from home. 10% in the office and the, re the balance basically on the hybrid model. And I think that's the challenge in the sense of, of being flexible to address the needs of the 22%, but actually trying to, I suppose, convince them that they're missing out on that cultural aspect, that other parts of it, you can do a function, but you can't be a community, I think, if you're, if you're dispersed throughout the organisation. Uh, Governor, I want to put two points to you before I get down to some of the questions. And as I said, there's some really interesting topics coming in. And, and the first is that idea of this new hybrid model. And as I said, it's, it's, it's empty in Grand Thornton. If I crane my neck around, I can see the central bank. And as you said, it's largely empty as well. The streets are deserted. And it strikes, you know, how, what does all this mean for the future of property, right? And three of the questions that I've got so far relate to property. Irish people have a fascination. But if we don't need the same number of desks, if we don't need the same number of square footage in space, what does that mean for the future of, of the property market? I think it's, uh, it's too early to say, Ian, um, uh, partly because... Uh, what you've just heard, um, I think the future of the world of work is in development. Um, I have the sneaking feeling that even those people, the 22% in that survey that we just heard about who want to work exclusively from home, I just wonder whether they want to work exclusively from home for the time being, as opposed to forever. Um, so I think uh, my gut feel today is that we will still have a need for offices, that um, obviously there may be a difference in, um, uh, in the, uh, the amount of space we need in those offices, although paradoxically, um, because of the pandemic, and we don't know the sort of confidence levels we're going to have and when that will come. We may need more space. And, you know, the sort of old offices where people will cram together may not be sort of socially acceptable in the future. I mean, that's, still, that's a very open question. But I think there'll be a role for officers still, in my view, that cohesiveness uh, of uh, organisational cultures, um, the... the you know, everything I talked about earlier, um, my, my instincts are that we'll still need those. I do think that uh, when it comes to retail property, um, uh, that may be different um, because I, and again, I don't know, but I think it is more vulnerable to the changing habits uh, of people's, uh, you know, people's online shopping. Um, and in terms of residential property, uh, demand for that is going to continue to be high, but it may turn out to be in different places. So um, if remote working becomes the norm, um, we may find that people are, you know, want to live outside of uh, central Dublin. Um, on the other hand, you know, central Dublin has other attractions. And, uh, but so in my, in my hierarchy of what will happen to property, I think residential property, and that's been the, you know, the, uh, the reality of the last 11 months anyway. I mean, I think the demand for residential property is not gonna go away. Uh, I think the demand for uh, commercial office uh, property uh, to a large extent is gonna continue. Um, and I think there's a question mark over the extent of retail. And that it'll be absolutely down to uh, consumers and their habits. Uh, as to what happens to retail. And another point, it's a slightly off piece point, but it's, I want to bring together two strands of something you've talked about. And number one, it's young people coming into the workforce and struggling to kind of get embedded. But you also mentioned the unemployment rate. And I think one of the striking things for me from Pascal Donoghue's budget speech last September, October, was the staggeringly high levels of youth unemployment. And this pandemic, Governor, really seems to be impacting on the next generation, the younger people coming through far more than anyone else. How do we, what do, what do we do to stop this, to prevent, and I don't like using sound bites, but what do we do to prevent this 
looming lost generation? Well, the first thing that uh, we've all done uh, by implication, Ian, is that we've recognized it. Um, we've recognized the risk because I think uh, uh, there's always a, a danger that you, 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 you miss it. So we've identified the risk and I think policy needs to make sure, and I've been saying this now for a while, we need to make sure that the scarring effects of the shock um, are avoided. So government investment and support needs to uh, take precisely that uh, group into account as it develops um, uh, as it develops its uh, various measures. I mean, I do, you know, a lot of young people um, uh, experience work initially through the hospitality sector, uh, which has been the most impacted. Um, now, whether that can be uh, replaced in the short term uh, with added training, Etc. I don't know. I'll, I'll leave that to others. Um, but I think hospitality will return. Um, so uh, you know, the the later generation. Let's hope this thing does not last very long. This pandemic. Um, I think that sort of experience, people will um, will be able to sort of gain again. But the most important thing, from my perspective, is to be very conscious and very aware of the groups, and it's not just young people. I mean, I think we are, I am uh, worried about the impact on, on women um, in particular, um, because it's still the case that uh, if, uh, you know, the home responsibilities tend to be taken on by women, um, and one hopes that the remote working world that we've gone into is not going to lead to a uh, relapse in the progress we've made. So there are a bunch of groups uh, that have been affected. Government has got a role to play in the support, but actually employers have got a very big role to play in some of the impacted groups and uh, need to be uh, thinking quite carefully about that because a lot of these people are their future workers. Just two points on that. One in relation to the mar some marginalised, the, the people most affected, but the governor has also talked about the sectors such as retail that he believes are most affected. And obviously you've a lot of visibility, you've a lot of clients across a range of subjects and the experience of the last decade. What's your view on the sectors and the people most impacted? Yeah, well, we can do, do the second one first in the sense of, of I think, uh, to, to the governor's point, I think that the, the day of the debt, the debt of the offices has been way overstated. I do think uh, when uh, we move into the, the new phase going forward, offices will be a key cornerstone of, be, of businesses into the future. It's, it's, it's the centre, it's how culture can actually um, move down through an organisation. Um, it, it's, it's used more than just a functional aspect in, in relation to employment. I think how we use our buildings will be fundamentally different going forward. Uh, I think the idea of a desk for five days a week and, and people coming in five days a week is over. Uh, and therefore, how do how do buildings be used efficiently to be able to take all of its workforce in in an, in an efficient process, so that they don't have them full on a Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and empty on a Monday and Friday, because that that doesn't do anybody a, a, any good. Um, in in relation to the retail sector, the bricks and mortar, I think completely agree, and it gets back to I think those businesses are, are faced with how do they have the hybrid model, model themselves going forward? Are they online? I think there's a there's a natural wish and desire. Uh, to basically still shop local. Probably, if anything else, COVID has actually made shopping local even more important. But if the local business is not online, they're not going to survive. So, so you don't necessarily need to be a multinational uh, web-based company to, to basically boom into the future. I think there's a role for small retail indigenous Irish companies as long as they can be found and as long as the experience online is as good as it is through a multinational company. In relation to people, again, I think it gets back to that point in the sense of everybody is handling it differently, no matter whether you're a 21, 22-year-old graduate, whether you're a, a, a key you know, senior member of staff, male or female, what is happening in your home environment, how you're getting to the work, how you're able to manage your day. And I think that's, that's bad partly, to, to, again, to, to the governor's point, how employers uh, are ensuring that if somebody sends an email at 11, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night, because that's how they've had to manage their day, it doesn't require somebody else to waiting by the phone to respond to that email because they feel if they don't respond to their boss that a black mark will be marked against them. We've, we've all got to realize everybody is working to different time zones, different ways, 
and we all have to react differently to, to, to how that is, is done. So the working week of nine to five has probably also been redefined because of what's happening in an individual's personal capacity as well. Now, Governor, here's the fun part. I have an iPad in front of me. The questions are starting to come in from the 500-odd people who are logged on. So I don't have control. You don't have control. We'll see, we'll see where we go. Uh, but I'll say one thing. There's a number of questions here, two or three, and they centre around three letters, FBD. Uh, were you disappointed with FBD's stance in relation to business interruption cover for the publicans? And what did you make of, we, when we spoke before, you weren't able to talk about it because I, when I interviewed you for the currency, uh, because we were waiting on a judgment, the judgment has come back in, FBD have lost, they have to pay out. So FBD, discuss, were you disappointed? No, I, I was disappointed. Um, and, uh, you know, but I, as I said in my uh, remarks a week ago, the, um, you know, we studied, we did, fr from back last March, uh, we identified this as a potential issue. Uh, and uh, the team at the Central Bank has done a terrific job in uh, getting to grips with, um, you know, the 250 different types of uh, policies that are out there and understanding which ones, identifying which ones uh, were likely to provide cover uh, which ones were actually had no cover, um, and uh, the ones that were sort of slightly ambiguous. But we, we came to a position where we were very, very clear uh, as to what should happen, and we published um, the, uh, uh, the framework we were adopting. And, uh, you know, I'm, I, I regret the fact that we've had this process drag on and go through the courts to arrive uh, at an answer. But we have done. And uh, to be fair to FBD, they have um, announced that they're not going to appeal it. And, um, you know, let's, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, there's now, uh, you know, no excuse to not proceed and uh, pay the claims. I mean, a general, a general point, Ian, which I think we did talk about when you and I last met, was... Um, uh, the insurance industry's relationship with its consumers in Ireland um, is one where, I mean, I think the industry itself just needs to reflect uh, on, uh, actually compare itself, if I can put it like this, compare itself with the banking sector over the last year and just reflect on where it thinks it's standing uh, is um, whether it feels it has gone up, stayed the same, or gone down, and compare itself to the banks. Um, I'm not going to. I'm not going to get drawn much more than that. But I do think um, it's something that uh, a bit of a period of reflection is definitely worth uh, worth doing. Michael, you ran an insurance company uh, for for a period on, under the sanction of the central bank. Uh, what, what's what's I mean. Let's not get into the FBD piece, but that idea that insurance companies are now the banks of, of in terms of public perception. One key thing in insurance is is consumer confidence. If consumer confidence don't believe that the insurance company is there to, for them when they're needed, um, then consumers won't buy the product because that and, and so confidence and trust uh, and the spirit is a huge part of, of that in the sense of of, of knowing that when you need them. That, that they'll be there to basically pay out. And I think it goes back to, you know, businesses generally can handle pretty much everything that's thrown at them except one thing. They struggle with uncertainty. They, they, businesses can, no matter what is thrown, once they certainly know that X, Y, and Z, that's fine. If that's the fact pattern, businesses will adjust, manage, and usually thrive, no matter what the, the scenario is. But when you don't know and you're uncertain and you don't know if you've got cover and you don't know what's happening, that uncertainty actually is the worst thing a business can happen. So to me, the clarity of, of the decision now being made, that, that there's certainty in relation to that going forward, helps. It helps businesses being able to, to, to move forward and, and, and handle. But the trust element of, 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 of wondering every time that somebody buys a product, is it going to be in the small print? You know, this is what we thought we bought. This is what was perceived that we, we were purchasing. But if I've got to look for the small print every single time I need it, that's the, that to me, I think, is a bigger issue. Uh, Governor, I have two questions here relating to Bitcoin. Uh, Elon Musk likes it. Uh, do you? 
Um, do I like it? Um, I, I actually have no view on it. Uh, I've spoken, I was asked about it um, before, if I think you asked me, and, um, and my, I, obviously people uh, want to put their money into it because um, they think it's an investment. And uh, as I said to you, Ian, uh, 300 years ago, people put their money into tulips because they thought it was an investment. Um, and some of them made money and some of them lost money. You know, quite a few of them lost money. Uh, and from the perspective of the governor of the Central Bank of Ireland, my main message to people who want to put money into Bitcoin, it is, you know, uh, you should be ready to lose all of your money. Um, I'm not saying don't put it in, uh, nor am I saying, you know, put it in. I'm just saying be prepared to lose all your money. So some people take the view that um, it's an investment. I mean, I, uh, and perhaps it'll turn out to be a sort of long-term investment. Uh, personally, uh, I wouldn't put my money into it. Um, but uh, clearly some people uh, think it's a good bet. Just a very quick follow-up on that theme, just a question in from Tom Jinx, uh, from, sorry, from Supreme Mohan. Will Ireland allow cryptocurrency-backed ETFs in the marketplace? Um, I, 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 I don't know uh, either way. I mean, I think that's that's an issue which um, we are, uh, which we'll be thinking about as you know, in, along with all of our European uh, European colleagues. I mean, from my perspective, um, that uh, I mean, I, I don't like connecting. Uh, I know it's now the sort of uh, the way it's done to connect the word currency with crypto or to connect the word asset with crypto. I mean, I, um, for me, it's really important that we're extremely clear uh, to uh, investors and you know, consumers of investment products that they know what they're doing. That's the key thing. Uh, inflation, Governor, is I'm actually staggered by the number of questions that relate to, to, to inflation. Uh, so this, this, the central point coming through it is, do you believe the central banks will allow a period of higher inflation, 2% or more or whatever, to try and inflate away some of the COVID-related debts? So what's your general view on... Well, the ECB's... Go ahead, Governor. I mean, the ECB's... Uh... The ECB's objective is price stability, and we've defined it in a particular way right now, following a review that we did in 2003, um, which is that uh, it's at or below uh, 2%. Um, we're doing a review right now um, as to, uh, you know, the first one in 17, uh, 18 years. Um, and we'll come out uh, in the second half of the year with, uh, with a review as to where we should go. Um, so I, I'm not really going to get drawn into whether we're going to uh, change our, uh, our current stance uh, in any way, or whether we're going to be comfortable with allowing inflation to run over at 2%. That's all part of the review uh, and um, part of the debate and a very constructive debate and discussion that we're having uh, in the governing council of the ECB. Governor, in relation to the banks, I think it's telling that we've gone through 40 minutes and we've barely touched upon the banks, whereas if we were talking 10 years ago or five years ago, the banks would have been the central motif of our conversation. Uh, a, are you happy with the resilience of the banks uh, in terms of how they're dealing with the crisis? Uh, B, what do you make of the banks continuing to complain about the high solvency ratios that they're that they're told they have to that they have to have? And three, I suppose, Ulster Bank is 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 down the road here. If if the bank leaves, we've less competition. I know you don't have a, a competition mandate, but but in terms of consumers looking on, they're very concerned about the lack of choices in relation to banks. Yeah, I mean the more choice we have. Um, the uh, the better it is for 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 everybody. I mean, I uh, I agree with that. But it's important that we have choice uh, when it comes to banking that is uh, stable, that is robust, 
um, that uh, ultimately works for the financial system as a whole. And I think, um, I mean, use the word, am I happy, uh, which is a very subjective, uh, very subjective word. Uh, as the, um, we said in our financial stability review before Christmas, um, the banks are much more resilient uh, than they've been before. We've tested their capital. Um, we've tested the financial system's capital against you know, a severe scenario. Um, and uh, it's, it survived that severe scenario. Um, the EBA itself is going to do its own stress tests this year, which will look at the EU's, um, the, the euro area's financial um, uh, resilience. Um, but uh, we're in a much better position, much better position um, than we were at the last crisis. And as I said right at the beginning of my re opening remarks, the, uh, the fact is this is not a financial crisis, it's a health crisis. The banks are still standing, the financial system is working to support people through the pandemic and the recovery. There is a connection, believe it or not, between the levels of capital the solvency levels uh, that um, uh, banks are required to hold and the fact that they're still standing through the most severe uh, economic crisis uh, for many, many decades. And uh, from my perspective, uh, that's a very, very good thing for the country as a whole. Michael, I might just bring you in on that banking piece. Sure. I, again, I maybe. It, it goes back to what I said, I think, at the start as well. There's a, there's a fundamental difference between 2008 and 2020, not just in the capital structure uh, of the financial institutions, but I think also in the corporate memory and the approach being taken by both the banks and also by the by borrowers and, and customers of the banks, where the in 2008, 2009, there had been 30 years of growth. I think banking, the Institute of Banking and Bankers actually ha didn't know how to handle the crisis. They had to learn through that component on how to restructure balance sheets. But this time around, that memory is still in existence in the organization. And therefore, they understand what they need to do to approach that. And they're also faced with a scenario where the customers themselves and their underlying businesses were very good businesses prior to the health crisis. So I think the, the, the also the borrowers and the, the customers are more sophisticated in their approach. They realize by going to the banks at the start of the crisis, explaining what's happening, explain to the bank that they're completely on top of their cash flows, they understand their business model, they can, they can again, go back to that certainty, they can flex, they can move ahead, and gives the banks confidence that they've got the right customer who can trade themselves out of this problem, creates a symbolic relationship between both of them that they work together. Back in 2008, 2009, quite a lot of the customers went missing on the banks. They thought by keeping the head down, by burying themselves in the sand, the crisis would blow over. And that frustration between maybe an inexperienced bank and a customer approaching it the wrong way led to maybe some of the, the, the initial push on where I think both sides of the equation in today's market understand by communication, by setting out the plan, the banks are there to help the customer as long as it explains the situation. I think that's a fundamental difference that existed back in 2008. Yeah, and just, just on that, Governor, one of the rise, we've seen a, a big trend has been the rise of alternative lenders, for want of a better phrase, kind of peer-to-peer uh, -peer lenders. Uh, what, what's your view? A lot of them operate outside the supervision of the central bank uh, and are not regulated. Would you like to see more regulation of that sphere? Yeah, I, I, let me come, if I, I'll come on to, I'll reply to your question in a minute. But I just want to uh, agree uh, with what you just, uh, what we just heard. Um, it, but also make a slightly different point, which is that, that that early communication and engagement between uh, borrower and lender uh, is also important if, if the business is not doing well. If the business feels that it's in trouble, uh, the sooner it can talk to its lender and the sooner they can work out uh, what to do about it, the better. Um, in contrast with what happened, what happened uh, in the financial crisis 10 years ago. But uh, to, answer your, uh, to answer your question, Ian, I mean, one of the consequences of the uh, international efforts to strengthen the banking sector over the last 10 years is that uh, non-banks uh, have grown. 
And um, I think it's uh, almost inevitable that um, at some point we are going to be, um, what well, we have been paying more and more attention to non-banks, and I have in particular been uh, very interested in uh, our exposure to non-banks. Uh, but whether they're investment funds or peer-to-peer -peer lenders, I mean, I think uh, to the extent that they're impacting uh, consumers um, and having an effect on the financial system as a whole, um, we will want them to be uh, operating well and uh, regulated appropriately. Uh, Governor, just in relation to Brexit, there's four questions here on my screen in relation to Brexit. There's a, theme, there's a theme to them. It's not about the threats of Brexit, but it's about the opportunities uh, in relation to financial services, taking people out of London. And there's just your view on the, on the opportunities there. And also, there's a very specific question here. After the Brexit rush, how will the central bank ensure a level playing field exists in regulatory supervision vis-a-vis -vis the UK and with our European partners? So I suppose it's two points. There's that regulatory piece, but also the opportunities that you see arising for Ireland out of Brexit. Well, our focus is on making sure that the financial system is well regulated, working with our European partners and... Um, uh, the, you know, actually, it's quite a live debate right now as the whole equivalence uh, for UK financial services discussions are going on in, uh, in uh, between Brussels and, and London. But we will, in, in some respects, we're not going to do any different um, in, uh, in the EU as we were doing before Brexit. I mean, we want to make sure that uh, our... Uh, our financial system works in the interest of uh, consumers across across the EU, and in our case, in in, um, in Ireland. In terms of opportunities, I mean, I think um, I I mean, obviously there are opportunities, but I think there are also there are also risks and downsides. Um, so uh, I, you know, from a central bank perspective, uh, again, we're just going to be very careful at making sure that those risks are uh, identified and managed. Um, so simply growing financial services in, um, in Dublin as a result of a move from London um, doesn't mean that uh, you know, uh, we aren't going to be careful uh, about that. Um, but clearly, we've seen a growth uh, in the financial service business, but so has Paris and so has Amsterdam. Um, uh, and, you know, I mean, it's, it was uh, inevitable. But I don't think this um, opportunity issue, uh, leaving the risks aside, um, should really just be talked about in the context of financial services. I think for Ireland in particular, um, partly because uh, of the English language, partly because of our connections to uh, the United States. Um, in some ways, the opportunities for the country as a base for inward investment, which is, it has been incredibly successful in over the years, um, but the manufacturing uh, that we've seen, you know, what I mentioned earlier, that has played such a big role in, uh, in supporting uh, the economy uh, over the last 11 months, that's an opportunity for us um, as a country. And um, so there are opportunities. On the other hand, if you ask me, um, was Brexit worth it for Ireland to have those opportunities? Uh, my, my views are undoubtedly no. Ultimately, everybody is a loser with uh, the UK's departure from the EU. And what we're trying to do is uh, to uh, minimise, in my view, uh, the impact of, uh, of those losses. Michael, you're talking to companies all day long. I mean, clearly, we've got some opportunities, as the governor said, everyone's a loser. What's, what's the mood music of business? I think, again, it's, it's a bit similar to the, to the COVID crisis. There are going to be winners and there's going to be companies that can adapt. And unfortunately, there are companies that, that basically it is going to have a, a significant impact on, on, their, on their business. 
Um, I think for the island of Ireland, and, and, and uh, I mean in, in, in total both north and south, this is, can be a great opportunity once we basically establish the, 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 the go forward uh, um, operating model. And I think that gets back to that certainty issue. Businesses, once they know the rules of engagement, can get on with it. I think you know sometimes a crisis um, helps a business con to thrive. And what I mean by that is that you can get quite la lazy and quite fat by basically supplying the same market that you've been supplying because it's easy and you just get into that, that component. Being forced to actually look at a much bigger market, which is mainland Europe, for product and for, for indigenous Irish goods, forces companies to get outside their comfort zone and maybe realize that it wasn't as difficult as it been perceived to be. And then you're in a market of 400 million versus a market of 60 million. So there is huge potential going forward um, once we all figure out the rules of engagement. And, and I think, so we're, we're very well positioned where we are to look both east into the into mainland Europe for, for our goods, but also to go back to that relationship we do have with, with the US and be the, the, the landing zone for, for US multinationals who want to put a real business into the European market and set this country as its headquarters, not just from a tax viewpoint, but from a, a bricks and mortar and a real product viewpoint going forward. So uh, overall, would you want Brexit? Absolutely not, but now that we have it, I think it can be in 10 years time, a significant opportunity for the, for the economy. Uh, Governor, one of, one of the things I love about when all the questions come in is you get a real sense of what businesses are asking and not just what journalists are asking. It's always a real eye-opener for me. And there's a number of people have put in the same questions, one I would have never thought of asking in a million years. Uh, when are we going to go cashless? Will COVID drive Ireland to a cashless society? It's obviously on the minds of an awful lot of businesses out there. I don't think we're going to go cashless. Um uh, very quickly. Uh, we're certainly uh, seeing a massive uh, increase in, um, in uh, non-cash payments, but uh, I, th I would be surprised um, to see cash disappear uh, very soon, and certainly we're not planning on the basis that cash will disappear. I mean, at the ECB, we've just finished a consultation on on uh, developing a digital euro, which we're now considering um, next steps. But you know, we've been clear from the beginning that a digital euro will be a complement to cash and not a replacement. Uh, we're certainly paying attention to what's happening in other countries. So the Swedes are leading the EU in terms of um, the proportion of uh, transactions that uh, are. Uh, are non-cash. I mean, a very significant proportion of, uh, if I remember rightly, the last number, it's in the teens, the percentage of transactions that were being uh, dealt with in cash, whereas the next highest in Europe is in the 30s percent. So, um, uh, and in Sweden, they've just announced a review, which I think will take a couple of years, um, where part of their plan is to this is the oh, plan, but one of the questions being considered is where is whether to abandon cash completely. I think across the euro area, um, it's a, quite a cultural thing, and I think um, in some countries, uh, cash is used quite a lot. Um, I I just don't think it's going to disappear. I think we're going to need um, probably a couple of generations, is my gut feel, uh, before we see our numbers drop uh, very quickly. On the other hand, you know, it's not that long ago that, um, that none of us had ever talked about Revolut, and you know, Revolut's arrived, and everyone, you know, it's now become a verb. So um, I think my job. And the job of everyone at the central bank is is going to be to keep a very close eye on uh, on what's happening in people's uh, habits and uh, cater for them accordingly. Um, obviously, the tax take. There's two points I just want to make about about the wider macro piece, uh, Governor. Uh, number one, are you concerned about the debt being generated by government to sustain the economy in large sections of it through this crisis, and Two, following on from that, is there's a significant concentration of corporation tax around a very small number of multinationals. How, is that a concern to you and to the central bank? Yeah, I mean, it, it's the, um, 
I mean, concentration risk is uh, is always something to uh, to be wary of. Um, but the reality is that uh, we have, in recent years, um, uh, seen a big inflow of corporation tax from multinationals, and the government has. I mean, the central bank has said, don't treat it as a sort of permanent source of revenue, and the government's recognised that as well, uh, and it hasn't. But the reality is that we have been helped as a country, and the state's finances have been helped by the success of the multinationals over the last year. Um, and, uh, you know, the, uh, the exports they've made, the profits they've made, they've paid corporation tax on, and that has helped the state uh, pay for the supports uh, through this pandemic. Um, so uh, we do need to be uh, careful in our long-term fiscal planning that we um, don't lock in uh, expenditure for which there is no uh, complementary revenue. I mean, right now, the, uh, the debt the government's taken on, I think, is absolutely warranted. I mean, it's necessary to avoid the sort of um, scarring effects, um, et cetera, that I talked about earlier. Um, and it's warranted and it's affordable right now. Um, so uh, my main, and it's, I mean, my main concern, um, and I've said this publicly, is that at some point soon, the government's going to have to have a plan for how it will uh, start to um, withdraw those supports and aim to arrive at a more sustainable debt position over the longer term, but it does not need to take and shouldn't take action today to, to, to achieve that, but it needs to have a plan uh, for it. Michael Breezy? I think, again, maybe a big difference in 2008 when, when, when the crisis hit, the, the reliance on stamp duty just basically came straight down and, and, and it was a shock to the system. Yeah. I think there, the, the changes in the global tax and the OCED rules have been well and truly flagged. I think the Minister of Finance understands that there's going to be substantial changes to how the tax systems operate. So this is not going to be something that, like, just in one calendar year goes from X to Y. I think there'll be a, a, a strong phased reduction in, in relation to that reliance that we have currently on it. But I think the, also the big difference is maybe 10 years ago, um, the tax take from corporation tax was, was the, the companies involved here, located here, maybe had more of a post box, post box yeah. presence in the country. I think over the last 10 years, the, the presence here has become much more real, sustainable, uh, and as that itself in the, ec in the economy, um, it, it is less reliance purely on the corporation tax, and I think it's more real business. Yeah. Uh, Governor, we're, we're closing in on our, on our deadline, and I'm going to take the benefit of being the person to ask the questions and ask a personal question, if, if I may. And it's, we started with leadership, so I wouldn't mind closing with leadership. When you look back on your career, uh, is there particular moments, turning points within it that help define your progression? So, you know, I took that job or I didn't take that job or I decided to go down a particular route. When you look back over the course, and you've worked in many different countries across a range of different areas, but when you look back on that, are there key sliding doors, turning point moments for you? I haven't spent a lot of time in sort of... Uh, writing my memoirs and reflecting on the sort of question you just asked. But undoubtedly, uh, through my career, there have been moments when I've moved from sort of uh, one role into a very different role. Um, so, you know, I've, I've uh, as, as some of your, uh, some of the people on the call will know, I, at, at one point, I I was a British uh, UK civil servant. I worked um, uh, as Gordon Brown's principal private secretary, a very different role to one that I did a few years later when I ran an organization of 10,000 people. Um, uh, and then moving, uh, moving countries uh, twice, you know, to New Zealand um, and, uh, and now to Ireland. I mean, I think um, all of those different moves uh, have given me uh, different experiences and insights which have helped to develop me as a leader. Um, was any one of them a particular sort of uh, big step? I don't know. I mean, I think um, 
moving uh, from uh, doing what you might call a traditional sort of analyst policy type role into running a very big operational organization. That was a very different uh, experience and a great learning experience for me. Uh, but I think, you know, I think all leaders as they travel through their careers, um, what they need to be doing is soaking in the learning, you know, sponging, uh, so, you know, it's, it, it act as a sponge because you learn from everything. You learn from the people you meet, you learn from the issues you face. Um, and it's really a question of building uh, on that learning um, as you go through time. At some point, Ian, I will uh, spend some time reflecting, not, not for a while yet, reflecting on my career, and I'll probably have some more specific answers to your question. Very good. Well, Governor, thank you very much for your honesty, and your honesty throughout. And I, think it, I think it's great that a person in your position is willing to field questions across a wide variety of topics. Uh, I think it adds to the transparency of the position and of the organisation. So thank you very much for joining us here today. Um, and thank you all for all of your questions over the course of the last hour. And to close off, Michael, I'll just hand it back to yourself for some closing remarks. Well, but thank you. No, thank you, Ian, uh, and thank you, Governor. Uh, I think it's been a very interesting uh, last 60 minutes. And, and to, to Ian's point, I think transparency uh, is important throughout, our, or throughout the economy and be able to have a, an uncensored uh, questions to be able for the governor to answer, I, I think is it, testament uh, to, to uh, the governor's ability, our willingness to, to basically come, come forward and, and step outside. I think the, 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 the similarities in relation to leadership has been very interesting as well, and both of us trying to um, navigate our, our organizations through this, this current crisis. So all that's left for me is to thank both Ian and the governor for their time this morning. I hope everybody has enjoyed it. This is the third in the series of our Grand Thornton uh, Leaders Lounge. Um, we will have another one in the, the not too distant future. So I would ask people to check the website uh, for, for details in that regard. So apart from that, have a great day and thanks for joining us.